So while these guys uh, get set up, um, let me just introduce uh, the next speaker, Matias Zaldariaga. Uh, Matias got his undergraduate education in Buenos Aires uh, and uh, got his PhD uh, from MIT in 1998. Um, after that, he became a long-term member here and moved on to the faculty at NYU and Harvard, and finally we were able to recruit him back here in 2008. Um, Matthias has received almost every award uh, uh, feasible for young uh, faculty members. He was a Hubble Fellow, a MacArthur Fellow, a Sloan Fellow, a Packard Fellow, and uh, is even a bona fide astronomer because he got the Werner Prize from the American Astronomical Society. Um, his research specialty um, is the study of the early universe and the use of astrophysics and cosmology as a tool for understanding new physics. Um, we're particularly pleased uh, to have him here because, uh, as most of you know, cosmology over the last decade has been uh, the most rapidly growing uh, and exciting uh, field in astrophysics and arguably uh, the most exciting field in physics. Uh, and moreover, uh, as uh, Nima indicated, um, there's tremendous excitement about the uh, interface between uh, cosmology and particle physics, about the uh, interface be the between uh, the very small and the very large. Um, and uh, with uh, Nima here on the one hand and Matthias on the other hand, um, we're ideally positioned uh, to be at the forefront of research um, at that interface. Uh, even better, since they both came here from Harvard, uh, Harvard is no longer at the forefront of research um, in this interface. Um, I, I hope that you'll feel free to uh, ask Matthias about cosmology, both in the question period um, and in the later uh, social events. I should also mention that there's another subject uh, that he's uh, uh, expert in. Uh, he just finished uh, studying for his citizenship exam, which he passed successfully yesterday. So if you have any questions about the Constitution or uh, American history, uh, feel, free to, uh, uh, feel free to ask him. Matthias. Thank you. Okay, great. So at least it shows up there, so it's good enough. Um, so what I thought, uh, uh, that what, what I wanted to do, um, and uh, this occurred to me, you know, after giving the title of the talk, so... Um, because, of course, I had to give this title much before preparing the actual talk, um, is to tell you a little bit about the cosmology, what has happened in, basically during the lifetime of, uh, of the Institute. It turns out that I was, uh, the more and more I was thinking about it, um, more in cosmology started, uh, or our understanding of the, of the mall, of a mall of the universe that we use today pretty much started with the discovery of the expansion of the universe, and Hubble's paper was published in 1929, just a year um, after before the institute was funded and uh, was uh, started. And, um, and, and furthermore, during these 80 years, uh, the more I started you know, thinking about what, uh, what things to highlight in this history, m it, it became apparent that more and more of the people that came through the institute uh, made significant contributions to, to the history of what we've learned of, about cosmology in the last, uh, in the last uh, 80 years, and which is pretty much everything in our in our standard cosmological model. So what I'll try to do is like pick some sort of route through this history, not being 100% uh, fair as to how much time uh, to cover in everything, so that I, but I can go along and mention various people that were members of the Institute or faculty and so on associated with the Institute, um, just, uh, just to make this a little bit more fun. So um, as, uh, as I was saying, uh, the, the beginning of modern cosmology perhaps uh, uh, started with the discovery of the expansion of the universe. Uh, Hubble uh, published his paper measuring the, the, the rate of expansion in 1929. Um, what he discovered was uh, by studying how galaxies uh, moved um, in the universe, he discovered that, that the objects that were further away from us uh, moved away from us at a, at a larger speed. So the faster, the further away something is, the faster it moved. Um, so, so, and that is uh, the direct consequence of, of an expanding universe if you just, th or an expanding situation. If you imagine this room and imagine that it, say, doubles in size in one minute, if you, uh, the chair that is away from you, you know, by one meter after this minute, because everything doubled inside is at two meters away from you, so it moved one meter 
in, in this one minute, while a chair that was four meters away from you after this minute is at eight meters, so it moved four meters in one minute, it, was, it had to be moving faster. So, and the, the further away from me is this doubling uh, implies a further, uh, a larger and, and larger um, speed. And so that was what Hubble uh, uh, found for the first time, and since then it has been measured with much better accuracy by s uh, different uh, means and many, many different ways. And it, it led to a very, uh, you know, very big change in the way we understand uh, the universe, right? Because now we have a very ch a changing universe. We have a universe that if we extrapolate uh, if we extrapolate back in time, um, things were getting closer and closer together. So um, eventually, there's a point in time in which everything is really, really, very close together. An initial time for the for the universe. So this expanding universe has an initial time, um, and it's also changing a lot. If you imagine some region of the universe having some matter, now you make it twice as big. This matter is distributed over a bigger region, and then twice as big, and it, it's uh, distributed in an even bigger and bigger. Size, so it's getting diluted as a function of time. It's also getting colder as a function of time. So, um, so the processes, the physical processes in this box, in this region of the universe, are changing a lot with time. So it gave us a picture of a changing universe, of a universe that's not always the same, with uh, different physical processes happening at uh, at uh, different times. So basically, we live in an, uh, what we come to realize is that we lived in the aftermath of some sort of event, some bang. Uh, that's the bang in the Big Bang. As a result of this, whatever it was, the universe started very hot, very dense, m everything moving away from everything else very, uh, very rapidly. And as, as time goes by, this uh, expansion goes, uh, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we've been able, in these in this, uh, 80 years of the life of the Institute, to be basically figure out, and by this we, I don't mean that I was involved, of course, in everything, or in many of it, or in, <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> in any of it maybe, um, so um, figure out exactly how this happened, what, what were the different, uh, what, what, what happened at, at various different times, and basically come up with, a, first of all, the first thing that happened is that people were able to come up with kind of a chronology of what the different, uh, the different events that should happen in such an expanding universe. For example, if you go back in time, the universe is hotter and more dense. Eventually, the conditions are such that you have nuclear reactions, and that's the time roughly a minute after the Big Bang, the so-called Big Bang nucleosynthesis. We think, or we know, that at that time, um, some of uh, the, the light elements in our universe, for example, helium, which is the second most abundant element, was mainly created at this time, minutes after the Big Bang. And uh, eventually, the universe becomes uh, cooler and, uh, and less, uh, and, 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 uh, and less dense, and eventually atoms form. For uh, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, hydrogen atom forms at the time called recombination. So basically, using the laws of physics that we can figure out in the lab, using observations from telescopes and uh, various other means, we, we could piece uh, together this uh, chronology of the different things that should have happened in this very changing universe um, that, we, that, we, that we live in. And of course, a lot of... Uh, not, not just, this was not just doing calculations, but this was uh, led to important predictions and observations. For example, um, for example this, uh, this fact that the universe was very hot in the past and in thermal equilibrium led to the realization that there should be a leftover light, leftover radiation from this very hot, uh, hot uh, period of time that should be observed uh, roughly in the microwaves the, today, and this is what's called the cosmic microwave background. It was discovered uh, uh, in 1965 and by Penzias and Wilson in, out of New Jersey. They were working at Bell Labs. I believe this antenna, which was used, is still uh, in display in one of the Bell Labs facilities, or what, I don't know how it, Bell Labs is called these days, but whatever uh, it is, it's, it's out there that you can go visit it. Um, but the cosmic microwave background has deep connections to the, not just New Jersey, but the Princeton, the Princeton area. I will, I will not go very much into the details of the story of the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, but in, here in Princeton, in the physics department, people were working on this. Uh, Bob Dickey, uh, Jim Peebles, uh, Wilkinson, they were all working on first uh, making the theoretical models of trying to understand what this radiation would be and how, how uh, how to observe it, and actually they were going to uh, build the experiments to go out and measure it, but they were scooped by Penzias and Winston, and uh, in, this, uh, 
in the journal where the, dis the, the main discovery of the cosmic micro background by Pencils and Wilson appears, there also appears a paper by, by, by Dickey, Peebles, Wilkinson, etc., giving the physical interpretation of this discovery of, the, of this radiation left over from the Big Bang. So this was a huge accomplishment of that period of time. Um, also, the calculation of this formation of light elements, the deuterium, helium, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the so-called Big Bang nucleosynthesis happened around 1940s, and and people went out and measured abundances of these elements uh, in stars and in faraway clouds of gas, etc., and, and and determined that indeed the, these abundances pre match with these calculations that one can do using nuclear physics and the understanding of how fast the universe needs. You, our understanding of gravity that allows us to figure out how fast the universe should exp or was expanding at various times in, uh, in the history of the universe. So this is uh, direct evidence that we understand what was going on minutes after the Big Bang, the fact that we can calculate accurately the, the abundances of these light elements and those uh, agree with, with actual observations. So that, um, so that, uh, that is uh, kind of the, the early history the early history of the establishment of the basic cosmological model of, um, of uh, this chronology of various things that have to happen and this realization that as you go back in time um, the universe was hotter and denser and the physical processes happening there were, uh, were different and that's also the reason for the connection between uh, uh, particle physics and cosmology because as you go back in time uh, processes with higher and higher energy were were occurring. Eventually, uh, it's the, the universe was hot enough that these particles that uh, Nima wants to study using the LAC were being produced in the universe. Some of them might have been left over, and it's this dark matter that I will uh, try to discuss uh, in, in a little while. So, and as you go back in, back in time, uh, the universe itself probes uh, physics at higher and higher scales. Of, of course, it's not as good as an, in some sense as an as a as a laboratory experiment because we have no, not much control. In a laboratory experiment you have some knobs, you can build it in different ways, you can bang this versus that. In the universe we get to observe what the universe is kind enough to, to show us. Sometimes something that we might observe might be just not possible with the current technology or it's just obscured by some other process or um, difficult to disentangle and we don't have a knob. We can just not go to the star and change its physics to try to see if we can pull out some other effect. But the reason uh, a lot of the recent um, developments in cosmology have come from the study of structure formation and that has happened uh, in, you know, starting maybe in, in the 80s and, uh, and, uh, or, yeah, uh, and, and until, until, until now. And by structure formation what I mean is, uh, or I already told you Hubble uh, was able to, um, to, to um, what, what he did was far, uh, measure distant galaxies, see how how they were moving away from us. So I alluded to the fact that this universe is not just a, a bunch of stars that form our galaxy, but it's much bigger than that. And there are other galaxies, which in this particular case Hubble used for, or the stars, certain stars there, he used to measure the, the expansion of the universe. So the, the universe is filled with things, uh, very, very big things. A galaxy is huge. Um, the light uh, takes to go to the sun like eight minutes, perhaps to cross a galaxy takes 100,000 years. The universe is 14, 14 uh, billion years old. Light has been traveling for 14 billion years and we see structures in the universe almost all the way to this scale. So there are humongous structures in our universe. Um, these galaxies form clusters of galaxies. They uh, form various filamentary structures, var various empty spaces, etc. So I will show you some movies uh, um, later on. And a lot of the, of the effort in cosmology in the last uh, decades has been to understand how this came about and see from, from trying to understand this process um, what we can learn about the universe. And we are helped by the fact that um, these structures evolve in time and we are, able to, we are able to make measurements of the evolution of this structure at, at different times in the history of the universe using the simple fact that because light takes a long time to, if, you, if, if you're looking at something that's very far away, it takes a long time to, to um, to get to you, so when you take a picture of something very far away, you're taking a picture of a region of the universe, how it was in, in the very distant past. So we can compare regions of the universe at different times in this evolution that leads to the structure that we see today and try to compare these different pictures and see if we can make them agree with our theoretical model, interpret how you go from one, what you observe at one time to what you observe at the next time. Um, 
It's, 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 it's if, uh, the equivalent would be if you're trying to understand how a person age, ages, you would not have a movie or pictures of the same person at different uh, times in their life, but you have pictures of people at different ages. And so you can imagine, you can understand how people age more or less by looking at these pictures, but sometimes this would lead uh, to confusions, right? Because not everybody of the same age uh, looks so equally young or equally old, right? But so the, the, the same exact same thing is what happens to us. So in studying the, um, the, um, the, um, the evolution of structure in, in, a universe, in, the, in the universe, there's been a lot of uh, different measurements and experiments that have happened during the last... I will highlight the two of them just to highlight some of the connections with the Princeton and the Institute. Um, one of the, so uh, the, um, one, one of them is trying to map, uh, is trying to map the distribution of uh, matter locally around us by looking at the location of galaxies, measuring the positions of galaxies in the more or less local universe. Of course, the definition of local universe, um, you know, very much evolves with time. Probably the first surveys of this kind that were done were mapping a little region that are now it's like minuscule with you here, and I'm still calling this thing, which is humongous for like 1980s kind of standards, the local universe, because now I will compare this with the cosmic microwave background that sees a much bigger, the much bigger region, and we would say, ah, this is just a our neighborhood, but it's you know a very big region of the universe. In any event, uh, the one of the, m the 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 main surveys that has been able to me measure in detail the the distribution of matter in our local more or less local universe is the so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, just the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, I, I think, was uh, conceived by Jim Gunn, who is a professor at the university, who has guided this project, I think, for, for all, of, all of its, uh, all of its uh, you know, history. And, um, and um, even the Institute ha was uh, um, fortunate enough to get involved in, this, in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey at the beginning, even financially. It contributed uh, as a uh, certain amount of money at the beginning of the project, which allowed members of the, of the, um, of the institute to work in this project, use the data, etc. And so if you look at uh, a list of people involved in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, you will find lots of members of the institute. For example, you would see Mike, Michael Strauss, a professor at the, at, the, at the university, or Max Tegmark, or at MIT, uh, various, various, uh, David Weinberg at Ohio State, they all uh, um, worked on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and they benefited from the fact, or many of them at least, benefited from the fact that when they came here at the Institute, they were allowed, because of this initial contribution to the, to the survey, to, to use this data and, and, and came out to do wonderful discoveries. So what did the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey do? It mapped the location of galaxies. In this map, each point here uh, is the location, the actual location of a galaxy, and you, st you start seeing, and I hope in some a movie I will show later you'll see it better, you start seeing all of these structures, uh, wall-like structures, nodes, empty spaces, all of that. So I here galaxies are just points, so, you know, uh, I've been treated for this plot as just a point, and still there's this uh, humongous structure even on scales much, much larger than a galaxy, and a galaxy already is, is, is huge. The other, the other, um, big uh, development in trying to map the universe and try how to see how the distribution of matter in the universe is was the measurement of the detail uh, the, the measurement of the temperature of this cosmic microwave background in in in, in detail so the so-called um, temperature and isotropy so the discovery of the cosmic microwave background was uh, the observation of this radiation that was coming from every direction in the sky and it was equivalent to what a, a body of a temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin would radiate and you would see it isotropically in every direction of the sky and that convinced people that it was cosmological. But it was realized that if the universe today is not, uh, per, is not homogeneous, there's all these structures, these galaxies that form all of these things that we observe, if you go back in time, at the time when this, when this uh, radiation, the cosmic micro background is, start, is coming towards us, these 400,000 years after the Big Bang, um, the universe also was not going to be perfectly isotropic, um, or perfectly homogeneous, sorry. And uh, there should be differences then in this temperature that one should eventually be able to, to observe. And indeed, uh, you know, first starting with the discovery of these anisotropies by the COBE satellite in, in 1992, since then there, there is a, there, there, there's been a, a, um, 
a tremendous excitement in trying to map and make better and better maps of this temperature of the microwave background because it's basically telling us how the matter was distributed in the universe 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And the big Im important thing to remember is that the universe was nothing like it is today. No big galaxies, no big contrast between places of MT and galaxies. And no, it was almost all homogeneous with only tiny differences of 10 parts per million from, from one place to the other. And what has happened is that in this history of the universe, this 14 billion year history of the universe, these small fluctuations have grown to form the structure that we see today. And this is a map of, in some sense, the infant universe before this process of, uh, of growth of structure could have occurred. The, um, the, um, the best picture that we have today, at least published picture that we have today, um, it comes from the WMAP satellite, which was also Princeton uh, uh, based in some sense, a big uh, component of the WMAP satellite is at Princeton University. Um, the W in WMAP uh, stands for Wilkinson, who was one of the first people in, in this original paper that I mentioned of the discovery of the cosmic microwave background. Um, and here, a lot of people that uh, um, involved with the institute, but most notably David Spurgel, who was also a member here and, uh, and uh, even a visiting professor, is uh, you know, one of the main people behind this experiment, which, which has revolutionized uh, the way we understand many of the properties of our universe. And I say this is the, the best uh, uh, published map of the cosmic microwave background because there's a European satellite the follow-up of WMAP, which is already taking data. It has taken I mean, like a couple of years of data. And for all, all we are told is that it's great and it has worked perfectly. And so in the computers of a lot of people, mainly in Europe, there is a much better map that most of us has not been able to yet, yet see. And they might have many, you know, many, the things that I'm telling you are questions that we, or I will tell you a question that we want to answer. Maybe the answers are already sitting in some, somebody's computer. Um, so we basically have a, a very much of an understanding of how this structure uh, came to be that we observe in the universe today. We see these, how this uh, process started with a picture of the cosmic microwave background. is the natural consequences of gravitational instability. So if you have a little bit more matter in some place, it, uh, the pull of gravity towards that region is uh, stronger. And so matter starts to accumulate until eventually it forms uh, the structures, uh, you know, bigger contrast structures that we observe in the local universe. And, uh, and so we have uh, this, this, uh, we have a very uh, detailed standard model that tells us how to go from one time to the other and it pretty much works, uh, works uh, very well. So this is uh, the, the, the artist's conception uh, because not, a really, not even a numerical simulation of how it happened. So, um, but it's just a nice illustration that produced by the WMAP team at some point. So you have these uh, this, uh, small uh, fluctuations, they grow, they eventually form uh, um, um, bigger and bigger contrast objects, they form galaxies and so on. And then, so as, as you, if you look in a telescope, nearby is the more de developed universe. In the back is the cosmic microwave background. So these little fluctuations, which were tiny, just 10 parts per million, only 400,000 years after the Big Bang, they started growing, growing, growing until they, they, uh, they, the matter started to coalesce in the places which were denser and eventually formed all the structure that we see. And uh, although this is, an, although this is a, just a, an, an artist's conception, we, we can do calculations, real calculations. We can predict how things should be. We have pictures at various different times. And everything more or less seems to, seems to work. Um, and and uh, you know, a lot, uh, you know, this, uh, all of these uh, calculations of how, how um, the, the universe, the structure in the universe, um, evolves in time and how different experiments may, may, have, uh, may, have, uh, may be sensitive to different, different properties of the universe were done starting in the late 80s, uh, 90s, and so on. And by a lot of people, a lot of the members uh, in the institute at that time, including myself, were occupied with trying to do these type of calculations. For example, Wayne Hu, who is now at the University of Chicago, or Max, that I've already mentioned, Max Stegmark, Daniel Eisenstein. Um, many, many of the of, of the of, of the former members during this period of time were were involved in trying to make these calculations, com trying to compare with these upcoming experiments, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and WMAP and Planck, which now have already happened. 
Um, and this is, is a movie produced by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, which has real data in the sense that the locations of each of these little galaxies in the movie is the actual location of a galaxy in our universe as measured by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you fly through just so that you can start to see when this rotates uh, these structures, these filamentary structures, these voids that are in the distribution of galaxies and matter in our, in our local universe. And eventually, it will also show the cosmic microwave background. And all of, of this is to scale in some sense, so that you can, te you can see you know, what is the region of the universe that we have mapped using the locations of galaxies, what is the region of the universe that we've been able to map by measuring the cosmic microwave background. Um, and you will see, I mean, this uh, movie, the galaxies look like uh, they, they are in just in various directions only, and then there is black. That just is because the survey only covers a, a fraction of, of the angles in the, in the sky. Uh, but so this gives you, in this, uh, this is more or less, a, or is uh, up to scale, it's to scale. So you can see the map of the cosmic microwave background and the part in the inside that we've mapped using galaxies, or the Salon Digital Sky Survey has mapped using galaxies. And so you can see, that's why I was calling it uh, more of the local universe, uh, this measurement of the local universe and the properties of the universe now. And this was more, uh, and this is more the properties of the universe at, the, at its, close to you know, very early on in, in its history, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, that then, so, so this picture is both a picture, if you want, in space. So we see the cosmic microwave background from far away. We see these galaxies nearby. But it's also a picture in time, because we, the, 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 the light from the microwave background comes from us 400,000 years, from 400,000 years after the Big Bang, while, uh, while uh, the galaxies around us are, 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 are more local from the from uh, you know, the current age of the universe, 14 billion years. Um, so, by the way, 400,000 years uh, uh, looks like a long time. You say this is not the very beginning of the universe, but the universe is 14 billion years old. So compared to 14 billion years, 400,000 is, uh, is, uh, is a small number. It's like taking a picture of me when I was like 10 hours old or something like that. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not the birth, but it's, it's uh, also pretty, pretty much in the beginning. So. Um, Okay, so, and, and, and I think, I think uh, it's, it's, it's incredible to realize that uh, all of these things have happened so quickly for cosmology. Not in many of these uh, big discoveries were not even, uh, you know, not even we have to go to the entire history of the 80 years of the, of the Institute, but have happened in the last uh, 20, or 20 years or something like that. Um, okay, so, so what have we learned? Okay, so we've, we, we've mapped the universe uh, with a, a much better uh, ability than we had done before. What did we learn? So we've been able to construct a model that allows us to calculate how this structure has to, um, um, grew in time. And we, are, we have been able to uh, determine the parameters of the model very accurately to make, that makes uh, the predictions of the calculations and uh, observations match up uh, nicely. Uh, and so we have this very, very nice uh, um, standard model for, for this uh, after the Big Bang, after the Bang kind of history of the universe. Uh, for example, if you take the energy density in a region of the universe, we figured out that 4% of it is in atoms, 22% must be in this uh, dark matter, whatever that is, and 74% must, uh, must uh, be in what is now called the dark energy or Einstein's cosmological constant. So the, 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 the model is beautiful, it works great, and it allows us to make a very, very nice and detailed predictions about structure formation. Of course, at the expense of having most of the, of the matter in the universe be in forms that we have not yet tested in the laboratory. Dark matter, as uh, Nima has uh, told you, maybe is just around the corner, and, uh, and, uh, and this dark energy, as Nima was also alluding to, this is um, this vacuum, the best explanation for it, or what, meaning um, what best characterizes what we observe in terms of the expansion history of the universe and the growth of structure, is that it's just the vac the basically what's left over of this vacuum vacuum energy, these uncancelled 10 to the 120 terms, they do not cancel perfectly, and what's left over is this. Why, why this amount is left over, I think nobody knows, um, but that's, that, uh, that is uh, the best uh, explanation for what we, for what we observe. Now, um, 
and 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 this uh, you know just uh, to complete a little bit the story that uh, that uh, that Nima had said uh, the expansion of the universe the 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 prediction that Einstein uh, did not want did not want to make I think in 1917 I think so um, um, when he was uh, building using general relativity building models of uh, cosmology he didn't want he, he wanted to have a static universe so what he did was um, was introduce this additional term, this cosmological constant term, what, so um, that allowed him to balance the attractive uh, nature, the usual attractive nature of galaxy of gravity, with something repulsive that kind of st st balanced one against the other and have the uh, have the universe not uh, not expand. Um, and is this cosmology this uh, this um, Repulsive nature of this of this uh, form of uh, energy density that we now are going we are now using at for for describing this accelerated expansion of the universe that has been that that, that we have discovered. So basically, the this um, so so um, at the time or it said I think I I, I believe uh, Gamow in, in in a book that he writes says that. Uh, that um, Einstein thought that the introduction of this cosmological constant was his bigger blunder or his biggest mistake because in the end it was discovered of course that the universe was uh, expanding so there was no need for, for, for trying to balance uh, that, that normal attractive gravity with something repulsive. But now that we've discovered that the, ex the expansion of the universe is accelerating we need something repulsive and we've uh, come back and reintroduced uh, this uh, this concept, by the way, uh, a lot of um, a lot of um, the work um, to, to to establish the the fact that uh, there is this uh, dark energy in the universe did, did not come from from the, the study of structure formation, but came directly from the line of, of thought of Hubble himself, trying to measure um, trying to measure how fast things were moving uh, as a function of their distance uh, from us, trying to make a better and better Hubble diagram, and um, and uh, and a lot of that work was done using the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, to take this opportunity to mention that John Bacall, the, the um, late uh, professor here at the School of Natural Sciences, he was a big proponent of the Hubble Space Telescope. He was, um, together with uh, Lyman Spitzer, responsible for com convincing everybody that this was a great idea to to build the Hubble Space Telescope, which was a, a, a tremendous machine for for astronomy and also. You know, it has a huge public uh, opinion recognition and has discovered lots of lots of things, much m many more than were envisioned by, by, you know, by at the beginning when the when when the telescope was uh, was constructed. But making a detailed measurement of the expansion history of the universe was uh, indeed some of the things that people wanted to do with the Hubble Space Telescope. But at the time, people wanted to measure the Hubble parameter, this rate of expansion that. Uh, Hubble had measured much better, but also they were looking for the next uh, parameter, which was called the deceleration parameter, because everybody knew that the universe was going, the expansion of the universe was going to be decelerating, and so by measuring this deceleration, they would be able to know how much matter there was in the universe. Turns out, the universe, the expansion of the universe, was not decelerating but accelerating. Um, okay, so so we have a great cosmological model. It, it allows us to to to, um, it allows us to calculate a lot of things about structure formation, um, and, uh, but in some sense it's incomplete. It's both incomplete because maybe we have these forms of uh, energy density that we don't quite understand, but it also it forces us to think about the initial conditions of the universe. Um, uh, it forces upon us, uh, have, you know, th there are certain things that we, th th that we cannot of the, of, the, of the things that we observe in the universe that we cannot uh, explain by just processes that we that we see in that, that we can make work in this history of the, in this after the big after the bang kind of uh, history of the expanding universe that I've been talking about. So let me let me uh, let me um, spend a few minutes trying to get that point across. So there's there's one con counterintuitive fact about this expansion of the universe in these uh, models that we, that, that we build using our understanding of gravity and so on. So uh, the, the, the universe is expanding. So things are moving far away from each other as time goes by. Or if you take two things, they're closer and closer together as you go back in time. But in some sense, when you go back in time, the, thing, the two things, even though they're closer, they are really uh, further away. 
That is so if you measure their distance, not in meters or something like that, but com you compare that distance with the age of the universe at the time in, in the past that you're considering. So, so let me give you an example. So let's just take two atoms, two something that is now separated by two, 10 million uh, light years from each other, okay? Um, so today the, the age of the universe is 14 billion years. These two points are separated by 10 million light years. So there's plenty of time for light to go from one of the points to the other because there's many, you know, there's only 10 million light, light years away. So these two points are in some sense in causal contact. They could send light to, from one to the other, etc., etc. So let's now trace them back in time. Let's, uh, let's uh, assume that these two things are just moving with the expansion of the universe. Let's just trace their, their location just using how the, 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 the expansion of the universe. What happens a third of a second after the Big Bang? I just speak, of course, these numbers at random. So a third of a second uh, um, after the Big Bang, you trace back their, their separation. They are only half a light day away separated. So they're much closer than the, they are today. So this is the expansion of the universe. Things are going from being close by to being far away. But if you compare this uh, half a light day with the age of the universe, now the age of the universe is only a third of a second. So there's no time for light to go from one of these atoms uh, or these points to the other. So even though they're much closer uh, together, measured in compared this distance to the light, the distance light can travel since the Big Bang, they are now very far apart. So far apart, they are not even in causal contact. In the history of the universe, there wasn't enough time for a signal to go from one of these two points to the other. Okay, so even though things are getting, you know, um, closer together, they are really in some sense getting further apart. So, so that's, uh, and that's basically happening because in this, uh, in this uh, history of the universe, gra uh, gravity is uh, being attractive means that these velocities uh, in which things are, um, are moving past, uh, f uh, away from each other, if you go in the past, they're faster and faster and faster, and th this leads to this, to this effect. Um, okay, so this uh, has some consequences for us, because, for example, you can ask the very simple question. You look at this uh, cosmic microwave background, and you look at two pots, spots in the sky, uh, and you ask the question, okay, the, the, the light from this spot came to us, the light from this spot came to us. So these are different, this is just a cartoon for different points in this, in this map of the microwave background. But light started traveling to us when the universe was 400,000 years old. So light could on, only from this darker region did light have time to get to the point where, that we are seeing in our map of the cosmic microwave background to, 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 to um, only, only the, the points in this part of the, of the, of the universe um, uh, were able to communicate, if you want, to the, to the point that we're seeing. So now you, you look at another point in the sky separated by more than a couple of degrees, and you realize that these two regions, that f which were in causal contact with the one that we are looking at, w did not have time to talk to one another. In other words, if you look in that direction, you look in that other direction, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, there wasn't enough time for any signal to go from that region to that other region. And that's when the light started traveling to us. So we take the picture of how the universe was 400,000 years after the Big Bang, we look in that direction, we look in that other direction. What was happening there apparently had nothing to do at that time with what was happening what, over there. Even though today we can see both of these places, at that time they couldn't see each other. Okay? So how come both of them look so much the same. Both of them are two points at 2.7 degrees Kelvin. How come uh, the universe looks so much the same even though um, they didn't have time to arrange themselves to become in thermal equilibrium or anything like that? Furthermore, we see all these structures that will then lead to these uh, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, filaments, voids, etc., imprinted in this, uh, in this map that they will grow. How, how did these uh, structures come about? If, there wasn't enough time to rearrange matter because not even light could move from one place to the other. And we see structures covering the entire, the entire, um, the entire sphere. So how, how did this come about? So in some sense, there are many, many universes inside our universe. These regions are not connected uh, at the time. How, 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 did, how did this come about? Um, so um, so this, uh, this, uh, in this map of this uh, infant universe, all of these structures that were there, we don't, we don't have a way to produce these structures during the normal evolution of, the, of this hot Big Bang uh, model because not even light can go from one place to the next. 
And so since the since the um, the um, the measurements of W map and some other experiments, uh, more or less at the same time. Uh, we, we, we have known uh, for a fact that these small differences that we see in, the, in, the, in, the, in these maps must have been put, must be there from, the from some other time before the, the normal part of the evolution that we are able to describe with our model. We have a very successful model, we can piece things together, but the, a, lot, a lot of what we see hinges on some initial conditions that are not produced during this period of time that we can describe. So, um, so we have a very successful model. We can calculate a lot of things, but the universe is filled with matter that we don't 100% understand. And also we need uh, some initial conditions that are very relevant to what we'll end up seeing because we, don't, we cannot uh, accommodate those seeds and we cannot make them uh, during the, the, the evolution that, of the universe that we have already described. So what, what, are, what are things that will happen in the next, uh, in the next decade or decades? What, so, a lot is uh, will be trying to um, trying to solve these two puzzles, or at least get more data on, on these two puzzles: the puzzles about the initial conditions and the puzzle about these uh, different forms of, of matter, the dark matter and the dark energy. So we have a standard model for these uh, initial conditions. We have a, what something to put before the the, nor the big bang that so the, the after the big bang phase of the universe that we have so successfully. Uh, made work in comparing with the data and so on. It's called cosmic inflation. It postulates that there's a period of accelerated expansion before, um, before um, um, the, 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 the Big Bang, the, the, the more normal Big Bang phase that I've been, talk uh, I've been talking about. Um, and it's where the energy density is driven by something like this cosmological constant or vacuum energy, something along those lines. And furthermore, the very beautiful uh, um, consequence of this, um, of this uh, theory is that it not, not only is able, because of this accelerated expansion, that accelerated expansion ends up meaning that points that appeared to be not in, low, in uh, causal contact in the CMB ended up being in the past during this period of accelerated expansion or cosmic inflation. They were indeed in, uh, in causal contact and that is why in the end we end up seeing a very, a very similar temperature, or this, almost the same temperature in the in the, the microwave background, but also it has the poten it, it, it explains why the temperature is not the same and creates uh, these small differences from place to place. The way it works is that um, this period of accelerated expansion has to come to an end. Um, there must be some clock, some physical mechanism acting as a clock, which is telling each point in space-time to stop inflating at some point to give rise to the more normal uh, after the bang phase of the of the evolution of the universe. Um, but this uh, universe was very small, and by the laws of quantum mechanics, it's difficult to measure time very accurately with a very small clock. And so what happens? Different regions, the clocks in different regions of space-time get out of sync. Inflation ends at slightly different times in different places. That slight different times is, nothing, uh, is the reason why the universe is not exactly the same, and there, there are these initial seeds that then grow and form the structure that we observe. So a, a lot of the next decade is trying to understand if we can probe, uh, test these ideas, see what, uh, what, um, what they imply and uh, our experimental, so the, the, the idea is to measure the cosmic microwave background in a, a more, more, with more precision, our experimental and, and measure other properties of the cosmic microwave background, for example its polarization. Our experimental colleagues are you know, making big progress in doing that. And uh, for, by measuring the polarization, for example, you can try to detect the presence of a background of gravitational waves. That is something that, uh, together with, uh, with a collaborator of mine, Uro Seljak, I, I propose doing, and also another member here, Mark Kamionkowski and his collaborator, propose this technique of looking at the polarization of the microwave background to see if there is this background of gravitational waves that would be left over from a period of inflation if it happened, and it would be detectable if inflation happened at a sufficiently fast rate. Um, the, and uh, there are also um, other, other ideas as to how to use these better maps of the cosmic microwave background uh, to probe various different properties of these initial seeds that uh, might tell us something about, about, uh, about the, the about inflation and some of these experiments like the Planck satellite as I said is already happening and there's um, some of these answers might might be 
might be in the um, in the in the computer somewhere, in some computer somewhere, or in many computers probably. Um, so um, the other the other the other puzzle is this puzzle about the acceleration of the universe and what what is this dark energy? And here I think at least what uh, what uh, from the side of astronomy one can do is try to measure the the, uh, the expansion history of the universe uh, um, in w with a greater precision, ten times or more time better than we have done it now, and try to confirm if it's indeed something like this Einstein's cosmological constant or vacuum energy, or or if the universe its expansion history is inconsistent with that. This is one of the main uh, one of the main uh, goals of. Uh, of the next decade of, uh, of uh, astronomy as, uh, as, um, as uh, evidenced by the fact that uh, you know, every 10 years or so, the most illustrious of uh, our colleagues get together and uh, produce a report uh, saying what you know, different agencies should do, what experiments they should fund. And what came on top for NASA is this satellite uh, to ex try to measure this, uh, this expansion history of the universe uh, in uh, in greater detail, and uh, let me, I, I want to stop to mention this because uh, of a, a few things. So one of the techniques that, uh, that uh, this satellite is going to try to use is the so-called baryonic acoustic oscillations. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, but just I wanted to mention it because of the fact that the theory of this was worked out by members of the Institute while they were here, uh, Daniel Eisenstein, Max Tegmark, Wayne Hu, um, worked on this. Daniel went on to be uh, the leader on this technique, and this has been already applied to the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and he's involved in the follow-up of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So um, that uh, is a you know one, a big chunk of what this satellite proposed uh, next uh, generation ex kind of experiment wants to do. But it has a totally complementary um, objective, which is uh, nothing to do with cosmology, but try to find planets around other stars through the technique of microlensing. Um, now, it turns out that one of the first papers trying to uh, work out this technique was also done by members of the Institute of Advanced Study. In this, in this case, it was Andy Gould, who was visiting us this uh, week, and, uh, uh, and who's a professor at Ohio State, and Avi Loeb, who's a professor at Harvard. So, you know, half of the, of, or, or more of what uh, the main tools that people are thinking for things that this, uh, that this, um, next generation thing will do and try to answer some of these questions where it came up uh, in, uh, in papers written by, uh, by members of the Institute of Advanced Study in, in, when they were here, actually, in fact. Um, so anyway, so let, let, me, let me conclude. I, you know, it was a very selective history of, uh, of various things that happened during the last 80 years in cosmology. I just wanted to make sure I left you with the impression that indeed we have made a big progress in, in our standard model of cosmology. We can calculate lots of things, compare this with the data, it works beautifully. Of course, we have to assume certain things that we don't quite understand, and the next decade is all about, uh, all about trying, to, trying to sort those things out. And I also wanted to take the opportunity then to you know, mention as I went along, and I'm sure I forgot people and I was not, uh, you know, I'm sorry for, for, for that, but just trying to make a representative uh, a representative uh, um, example of various members and people associated with the institute, which were instrumental in this in this story, and uh, some of them who had done this work while they were here. And hopefully, you know, we can continue to provide them with a, a stimulating enough atmosphere and attract a, a good people, and so that this continues to happen. And in the hundred-year celebration, you know, the next uh, big uh, story in astronomy, whatever that would be, would also be dotted with uh, with um, with uh, you know the work from many of the members or faculty of the, at the institute, and I'll finish with that. We have time for one or two questions. When were the fundamental <coughs> constants uh, uh, de determined? For example, if um, <coughs> um, electromagnetic uh, interaction. The ratio of electromagnetic radiation to gravitational um, this uh, coupling is ten times bigger or smaller. There won't be any stars. And then, if the um, nuclear binding energy ratio is not 0.007 or become 009 or 005, carbon cannot be synthesized, and therefore the all-stellar evolution will stop at an 
kill him. Now, um, do you have any idea when this fundamental constants were determined in, in phrasing faith? Well, um, may, 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 y y y y yeah, to, to w one comment that uh, I, I would make uh, is that uh, um, indeed there are uh, a lot of these um, coincidences or or things that tend to point to the fact that if uh, the universe was slightly different than what it is, or the value of some of the constant life as we know it, or structure as we know it, would not have formed at all in this way. And this is totally true. Indeed, uh, you know, we, we are so at lost uh, for trying to understand these uh, 120 orders of magnitude discrepancy with the cosmological constant, that basically this is the best explanation that we, well, I don't know, want to, I, I want to say it's the best explanation, but probably it's the best explanation we currently have, as to why it has the value that it has and it's not much bigger. It's because you wouldn't, uh, and this goes back uh, to some work by uh, Steven Weinberg, for example, who argued that if the cosmological constant was uh, any bigger than what it is now, galaxies like we know them would not form. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a big uh, group of the community who, who thinks that maybe a lot of this uh, fundamental constant and for, for sure the cosmological constant in particular is just some sort of accident and it has take, it can take many values in different places and there's probably some humongously much bigger multiverse or whatever you want to call it in which in different regions physics is totally different and we are here just by a combination of luck and the fact that if it, things were not in, in the way they are we wouldn't be here. Um, whenever I go to such talks, I think uh, everything is very reasonable. I tend to agree with everything, but I walk uh, out with some sort of not very nice feeling. I'm hoping this is just all, all nonsense. And, you know, probably it is nonsense. I don't know. Oh, yes, at the back. Question. Um, it, it seems like we have a bit of a paradox where you say things that seem to be working. We have successful theories, but when you look at... Uh, the numbers um, uh, being very simple-minded, we, we understand, say, 4% of what we see out there, 96% uh, we don't. Uh, does, does that mean we're on kind of page four of a 100-page book, or, or what, what's your sense? Well, I, I guess it's a definition of understand at some level. We, maybe I should use the words more carefully, we can describe, okay? Using this model, we can describe what we see very successfully. Um, the dark matter itself, which we have uh, many more ev uh, you know, evidence coming from very many different uh, directions than the ones that I also discussed, that I, I personally don't think very much it's a puzzle. I, I'm, I very much think that, uh, that we will solve this and it's not, I mean there's a lot of things that have been left over from the Big Bang. There's a, you know, the photons, there's a lot of neutrinos floating around that if they could have had a mass, they would you know, be a dark matter. I mean, they, they wouldn't work in detail, but um, having a, starting the universe so hot in thermal equilibrium, a lot of things were produced. I think it stands to reason that something else uh, could have uh, left, been left over and there's plenty of candidates to go around. So that, I, you know, I don't know what it is. I hope it's interesting. It has a lot of phenomenology and we, uh, but, I don't uh, think that it will revolutionize the way we understand uh, how the universe works. It is not a real dark uh, dark energy or the cosmological constant has definitely this potential to the extent that if you in the most I said the most reasonable explanation is that there is this uh, um, you know other multiverse with different values. This sounds totally crazy, okay? And so if this is the most reasonable explanation that most the most reasonable people maybe go around um, you know talking about. It has, at least it has, it could be right, but it has the potential of changing, you know, things dramatically, I would say. Okay, I'm afraid we're going to have to, to, to stop here. Um, the next event is tea in Fold Hall, followed by Frank Wilczek's uh, lecture in Wolfenson Hall. Thank you very much.